So today we are going to do a review of the switch cap basics. Okay, let's go through the um, uh, things again. So this structure is very familiar. Okay, this is the integrator, RC integrator, and what we are saying is by by replacing this resistor with the switch capacitor, we are going to get um, uh, get the integrator working, right? And uh, by doing this, uh, we are able to see that the value of the resistance is given by um, the current is given by delta Q by delta T, okay? And that is given by um, if you see here, value of the resistor is one over F S C one. I think this should be um, kind of understood by now, right? Now, so you can create this uh, simple first order um, RC filter using uh, switch caps, right? And uh, and here you can see uh, the value um, or the corner frequency, which is one over RC R one C one R one C two is going to be given by sampling frequency multiplied by ratio of C one divided by C two. Okay, and the key point here is F S is comes from some kind of uh, clock reference, which is extremely accurate, and C1 by C2 is a ratio of two capacitors, which is 0.1% type of numbers if you do a good job in your layout. Okay, so essentially what this tells you is, if you uh, if you do implement the filter using switch caps, then your corner the integrator corner frequencies are very accurate. Okay, all right. Then we um, studied the switch cap integrator. Um, okay, this is what we did, and then uh, then we went through a Z domain analysis. First, we did a continuous time, uh, you know, integrator um, analysis, and then we did discrete time analysis. So uh, the architecture we used is the following right here, um, where X n and Y n. Okay, it's exactly the same thing as what we did in the S domain. Okay, um, so the and we have a delay operator z to the power minus one right here. Okay. So when you analyze this transfer function, it comes out to be one divided by one minus z to the power minus one. And just by taking this example numerically, right, we figured out that it's nothing else but you just have a moving average, or not even average, you just moving summation of all the past inputs, right? So that's called integration, right? So this represents uh, integration. That was the point. Then we went from Z domain to S domain. Um, I don't think I'll go over this part of the detail because I think you've done it many, many times, but this was just to make sure uh, the fundamentals are clear, okay? So um, here is what we did after that. We, we kind of went into a little bit more detail in terms of how does this really work in terms of charge conservation. And everyone knows that charge conservation is what happens over here, not energy conservation. And the reason it's not energy conservation is because Whenever the switch closes or opens, there is you know some energy lost because of sparks, or if the switch has a resistance, then there will be heat uh, because of the uh, you know I square R uh, dissipation in the resistor. Okay, so in this particular case, we just took a simple example where phase one, phi one, and phi two they are non-overlapping clocks. So switch caps, it's really important to have non-overlapping clocks. Okay, because if you don't have non-overlapping clocks, then the signal gets messed up. Okay, because it will you will not have a clue about what you sampled and what you're processing. So we are we are sampling and we are processing, sampling, processing, sampling, processing, and they cannot be continuous operations. You finish one and then you let go and then you do the other operation. So that's why the non-overlapping clocks. Okay. Now here what we did is let me go over this one more time because I know that this is kind of hard to digest. And I'll redo this again one more time in the class today so that you know all the basics are really solid, rock solid. So what did we do here? The phase one and phase two. And in this particular example, we are looking at output in phase two. Okay, And that's why we call it V out two. So at the end of phase one, and here is just a nomenclature. Let's say phase two is reference to T over here. And then uh, this node B is T minus T divided by two, uh, small t minus capital T divided by two, and T minus T. Okay, so these are the time points. At time point A, right here, okay, what's going on? We have closed this switch, okay, and um, we have closed this switch. And sorry, at time point A, we close this switch, okay, and this is closed. All right. So if this is closed, then we get um, there is no charge across C1 because there is a uh, analog ground or virtual ground across uh, both sides of the capacitor. 
and uh, you will have some value of voltage uh, V out and we call that V out T minus T okay because it is present at T minus T index right here okay and that will be CV QC we are only looking at this particular node okay it is important to know that because this is where the charge is conserved okay this particular node. So, we will always look out for um, the positive node uh, positive uh, node of the capacitor C1 and negative node of the capacitor C2 that is it and then we will figure out when the charge conservation happens uh, we will write the equation for that. So, in this particular case QC1 plus is 0 and QC2 uh, minus that is C2 V out T minus T minus value okay and at time point B what are we doing? At time point B, we are going to be closing this switch and opening this switch. Now, since um, this is open and also this is open and this is closed, okay. Since we opened phi 2, the voltage across this capacitor, this is an important point, some people asked me questions last time, is um, V out to T minus T, right. Once I open the switch phi 2, the voltage across the capacitor still stays the same it cannot move anymore okay because there is no the charge at node uh, this minus node is not disturbed so that voltage cannot change okay so even though when you open the switch phi 2 what phi 2 is doing is you're not looking at that output anymore okay you're looking at the output during only phi 2 phase okay and it will be clear when we start constructing the filter okay all right so this this is an important revelation Okay, if you get this right, then you will get switch caps right, which is, um, you know, the voltage that's stored across the capacitor doesn't change, and the index still stays the same, V out to T minus T across this capacitor. Okay, and now that we have closed this switch, what do we get? QC1 is C1 V in T minus T divided by 2. The index here has changed because we are sampling this voltage at that point, which is at this point input voltage at that point is sampled okay so this part and again this is the point i was belaboring about uh, minus c2 v out uh, t minus t and that's the point which is referenced over here okay the qc2 minus doesn't change once the phi2 is open it doesn't change anymore and in the next cycle which is uh, time point c Sir, on point b, Your question is what happens during phi 1, right? During phi 1 is what we are interested in. During phi 1, we are going to close phi 1, okay? So, um, we are doing the calculations at the end of this cycle, okay? When you, when you turn on the turn off the switch, right? It takes some time to settle down the values. And the operation, the, the calculations we are doing is just before we open that switch, okay? We give it enough time to settle, and then at the end of that cycle, what is going on? because now it's all stable values right that's what we are looking at not after you open the switch okay the calculations are all done so i see your confusion now so we are looking at this edge basically values during this edge before just before that edge because at that time the processing is finished okay and then uh, um, if you start here what will happen it's an important point if you start here, then the output is moving because you just turned on the switch and then there is settling going on, all that stuff. So, we are not interested in that settling performance, right? That we have taken care by making sure the op amp is, uh, has enough uh, unity gain bandwidth and all those things, okay? So, at time point C, what are we doing? We are again closing this switch. At time point C, I am going, um, going to open this and I am going to close this and close this. I want to open this, okay, at time point C, which is phi 2. So, the circuit looks like this over here. And now, whatever charge was stored on C1 uh, before is going to get squished out because it has analog ground on both sides of it. And that charge has to travel and gets deposited on this one. And as a result of this, what will happen is this voltage V out will change. And the index will update to V out to T, okay, because now we came from T minus T to the current value and it will keep doing that, 
over like that. Okay, so this is why this equation comes in. And then what we did is we made a, a charge conservation. Um, you know, we applied charge conservation when we closed phi two. So when you close phi two, what was the charge stored on C one and C two? And after phi two has been closed. Um, after the settling has happened, what is the final charge? And they have to be the same because the charge cannot be cannot evaporate anywhere. Okay. So during B and C, okay, these are the these are the two charges. And then what we did is basically these are the zero main ex, uh, uh, the the delay based expressions. Okay. And um, and then um, we uh, we did a Z transform. So Z transform, what it does is when you have uh, this delay, what do you get? T minus capital T by two. You get z to the power minus half, and with this one, what do you get? Z to the power minus one. And if you substitute, this is the expression you're going to get. Okay. And let's study this expression a little bit more carefully. One more time. Okay. First of all, it's an inverting sign, and c1 over c2. What does that represent? That represents the integration integration time constant. Okay. Then um, one minus z to the power minus one. This is our uh, basically represent integrator operation, right? And then z to the power minus half, that represents just the delay, because we sample the input in the previous cycle, then output is available in the next cycle. So there is a delay, that that's half cycle delay, and this is our v n. Okay. So this is the way to get a integrator. It looks a little bit convoluted, but slowly it will get clear to you. Uh, it's kind of we are going to the next level of detail, and we're going to go. You know, peel the onion further, and by the end of this lecture, you will be very comfortable with what's going on. Okay, so I promise you on that one. Now, uh, other comment we made uh, during that is, um, if I had looked at the output, okay, in this case, I'm looking at the output during uh, phi two. Okay, so then we have that expression. But if I had looked at the output during phi one. Okay. Then what happens? So what we said is that hey, the output across the capacitor C2 changed during phi2, and after that it's just held. You know, nothing is happening to it. So when you look at the output at t half a cycle later, what would happen? You add a delay, right? I mean, you get it because we are just looking at the output in time frame half cycle delay. So that's exactly what happens uh, when you look at the output in the phase one. Okay. Then what you get is uh, uh, that's what we proved. Uh, you get extra delay here. You get minus one. Earlier we had minus half. Now you get minus one. Okay. So um, I also made a statement that hey, now the transfer function depends on when you set, when you look at the output. So this is basically a time variant discrete time circuits. Okay. That's what you have to remember. Um, other thing at the end of the lecture last time, what I mentioned was if you have any capacitor at this node. Okay. What happens? Does it contribute to your um, integration time constant? It doesn't because this node, the virtual ground node, is always staying at virtual ground node during phi one or phi two. So the, any capacitor, uh, any charge on that capacitor cannot contribute. First of all, there won't be any charge across that capacitor. Okay, so then we are okay with that aspect. However, if if you look at this particular node. Okay, the junction of these two, you will have certain parasitic capacitance, and that parasitic capacitance will look just like this C1. Okay, you cannot distinguish between that C1 and a parasitic capacitance. So, as a result of which, in your expression, you will get C1 plus Cp. Okay. Now you may say that, oh, now I get more capacitance. You know, what's the big deal, right? Why are you making a big deal out of it? The reason I'm making big deal about it is because C1 and C2 are extremely accurate. You know, match capacitors. Where a CP is a something that's unwanted. It's parasitics, right? And that parasitic cannot be controlled. It could be routing. It could be the switch. Uh, you know, switches will have tubs that will, uh, you know, the diffusions that will have capacitors, and all these things are nonlinear. So, which make makes this part, this coefficient, inaccurate. As we change process, as we, uh, as different people do different types of layout, this will be a problem, right? Okay. So um, we kind of lose the advantage. Uh, of accuracy of switch cap filters just by this problem. So the big innovation that came in switch caps and that's been carried over in all sample data circuits later on is a parasitic insensitive switch capacitor integrator. Okay. All right. So uh, I mean I'm I'm kind of walking you through circuits which have problem, but they're easy to understand. And I hope you appreciate that throughout the class we have done this 
over and over. We started off with a circuit which was easy to understand, was, was not a good design. And then we figured out what the problem was and then we went to the next circuit, then we went to the next circuit. I could have given you the final circuit, but it would have been very hard to understand. But now you know the motivation and this process also teach you how innovation happens. Okay? Innovation happens in very, very simple steps. But this particular innovation really changed everything. You know, so that's why this is important. So let's go back to it. What's the innovation at this point? The innovation, um, unfortunately, I didn't put the reference of who came up with that idea. And there are many people who are fighting for that idea. So I didn't want to get into that debate right now. Okay? Uh, we are talking about 1970s and 80s, right, at that time. Um, so um, um, the point here is that, hey, you know, is a Henny Youngman, uh, do you people know who that is? He's a famous, uh, f not philosopher, but, uh, so he has the thing that he, the guy goes to the doctor and doctor say, uh, tells the doctor, you know, if I do this, then it hurts. The doctor is very sharp, he says, don't do that, right? So if it hurts, don't do that. So the same thing you apply over here, if it hurts, don't do that. Where does it hurt? Because we are applying input over here, okay? Because apply, we are applying input over here, that parasitic capacitance matters. So don't do that. That's the principle. I mean, many innovations came about because you do something and it's giving you wrong, wrong result, then you don't do that and you do something else. So the, the point I'm trying to make is that, um, you know, if you apply VIN on this side, then the parasitic comes into play. Which means that, what if I apply analog ground over here? Okay? Then what happens? What will happen? The CPE doesn't matter anymore, right? whatever CP is there, it won't matter. Because then it's always, again, I mean, we learn from this experience that if the parasitic capacitance holds uh, analog ground um, at it, in both cycles, we're cool. So same thing I'm doing here. I'm going to connect this, I'm not going to connect V in, right, because it hurts. So we won't do, um, uh, put analog ground, uh, we'll put analog ground over there. So now where do we put inputs, right? Huh? On the other side, we will put the inputs on this side. Correct? Okay. Now, if you do the inputs on this side, then let's see what happens. Okay? So, this is the innovation. So, this is phi 1, phi 2, and, you have, uh, and I'm, go I'm going to show you how this circuit works. Okay? We're going to go through the, the complete analysis of that one. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And let's go through the, um, the whole exercise one more time so that you, are, you feel comfortable. Okay, so let's draw the circuit. And um, one more thing I would tell you is, if you look at the textbooks, you will see lots of textbook on this, textbooks on this. Okay, but none of them will draw the circuit this way. Okay, only uh, this comes from my advisor. I mean, you know, of course, that's why I'm so proud of it. Uh, he draws these circuits in certain way, which makes it extremely clear how the circuit works. If you look at any switch cap textbook, including including Razavi you will not get it the way I'm going to explain it to you. Okay, you will always get confused which is the positive node, which is the negative node. Uh, so you can compare, uh, but I'm teaching you what I learned from, uh, from Professor Allstart, right? And it always makes it, as I, to, as I keep telling you, how you draw your schematics makes a big difference. V1, V2. C2, C1. Okay. And then as we learned today uh, or last time, this output can be looked at in phi 1 or phi 2. phi 2. And this we will call it V out 1t and this is V out 2t. Okay. So whenever you see circuit like this, what do you do? The first thing you do is you draw your, uh, the picture. I would like you to draw it because uh, otherwise it will become, after a while it will become, I mean these equations are fairly straightforward algebra, but then still if you do it by yourself, then it will help you. Okay. So this is our phi 1, phi 2 and the time point we choose, I am just, I just prefer this time point as t. Okay. And then t minus t divided by 2 t minus t. Okay. And this point I like to call A, B and this is C. 
just to so that you can relate to the two sides okay so let's figure out now uh, let's call this node vp and let's call this node vn and i'm going to be giving you the clue why i'm calling them vp and vn but you can you'll see that okay so uh, we are going to do the exact same exercise we did last time one more time so that uh, if there are any doubts they'll get cleared okay nothing new um, okay so what do we do first start where a let's see what happens at a at a okay so at time point a what what the circuit looks like uh, phi 2 is done at t minus t right so you circuit i'm just going to draw a small circuit here so you see it and this is connected to vn c1 minus plus minus plus c2 and then since we are looking at in uh, this is v out 2 okay so at end of phi 2 which is this point right here what do we have uh, what is q c1 minus is equal to minus c1 and then vn t minus t is this part clear okay why isn't it zero is that the question because in the previous case what we had was this node was connected to analog ground it was connected to ground right then what will happen is this node other side you know the capacitor doesn't have any charge because both sides are connected to analog ground that's why you don't have any charge but in this case i am connecting physically to vn if i connect it to vn then uh, you know the charge across there is the voltage across the capacitor is vn vn at t minus t so then the charge has to be then on the negative terminal has to be minus c1 vn t minus t is this clear now janvi okay good All right. and let's talk about qc2 and here also we will talk about the let's say minus yeah okay minus play what's going on there minus c2 v out to t minus t this part stays the same because it's the uh, the value of the output at that point we don't know what that value is it's just that value at that time okay and the next thing what we do is at b circuit looks like like this and here we are connecting it to vp and this side what's going to happen c2 minus plus so at end of phi 1 what do we have qc um, 1 minus is equal to can somebody tell me what will be this minus c1 and vp what's the index t minus t by 2 perfect it's is this one right okay and what is qc2 minus which is this node what is that going to be is it changing anymore nope it's it's detached right so then that can this change this cannot change okay the output cannot change minus c2 v out 2 t minus t correct okay and now comes the last point at time c and again we do this which is vn so qc 1 minus will be same expressions except the what has happened the time pointer has changed to t nothing else okay so this is going to be minus c1 vn t and qc 2 minus is going to be minus c2 v out 2 t part clear exact same as the, the first time we did it now it's going to be with a different index and then what do we do from b to c and c charge conservation happens right uh, when you go from b this cycle to this cycle you throw the switch and there is no way for charge to escape so what we are saying is that from b to c when the transition happens and the voltage updates 
there is charge conservation and that's where we write the equation that we want okay so what's happening during b the charge total charge at this terminal is going to be qc1 minus and then qc2 minus okay and this will be again qc1 minus qc2 minus okay so this is going to be uh, this part which is minus c1 vp t minus t divided by 2 what is qc2 minus c2 we have 2 t minus t correct equal to minus c1 vn t minus c2 v out 2 t does everybody agree on this hmm? all we are saying is that you know the total charge at that node is conserved so before at the end of cycle b and at the end of cycle c the charge is conserved that's what we are doing okay so first thing we can do is remove or divide by let's see what should we divide by by c minus c2 to the entire thing and what would you get c1 divided by c2 vp t minus t divided by 2 plus v out 2 t minus t is equal to c1 divided by c2 vn t plus v out 2 t does it all make sense okay so then we can uh, rewrite the expression and let's see or i think let's do the z transform so what can you tell me what the z transform going to look like c1 divided by c2 vp z and then what do you get multiplied by z to the power minus half plus v out 2 z times z to the power minus 1 is equal to c1 divided by c2 vn z plus v out 2 z is everybody with me so far okay straightforward now i can um, i can take this over here and i can take this over here you know just readjust everything and what you will get is v out 2 z and then in bracket 1 minus z to the power minus 1 is equal to c1 divided by c2 vp z and then z to the power minus half minus uh, what do you get c1 divided by c2 this expression right v n z does it have a z no it does not have a z right correct now i can just do remove this from here and then i can put it on the other side over here 1 minus z to the power minus 1 and this will have 1 minus z to the power minus 1 voila okay all right what does this tell you we got differential inputs absolutely right what shiva says okay so now we have positive input and negative input which we were badly looking for you remember in the filter design implementation we had to do fully differential circuits and things like that to get that negative input now here uh, positive input so here we get it for free just by choosing the sampling time either in phi 1 or phi 2 we can get the positive or negative sign okay all right I mean there is absolutely no magic here and we just did charge conservation and we wrote the equations okay so the uh, the time constants and everything we know now if we, if we had uh, we can take this further we can say v out one of z what would that be we add one more delay right I mean that we don't have to redo the whole expression again once we know how to do the core circuit then it just gets shifted by half delay so then what are you going to do you're going to add another uh, half delay to the expression so if you had to if you had solved it for v out 1 t 1 z right so the expression that i showed you phi 1 phi 2 and time points right you can choose whichever point to do the conservation whichever one you want the only thing is that this z will change because your reference points will change okay so that's the only catch here it is coming out nicely and cleanly there also it will come out but then you should know you know which one you're looking at where are you looking at the output in phi 1 or phi 2 okay so if we had to look if you had looked at output in uh, this output right here if i had looked at in phi 1 then whatever v out 2 was there i have to just add z to the power minus half or multiply by z to the power minus half and then that would be v out 1 so the expression is going to be i'm just going to write it one more time c1 divided by c2 
actually let me write it differently z to the power minus 1 now divided by 1 minus z to the power minus 1 and that would be your v p z minus c 1 divided by c 2 and we will have z to the power minus half now divided by 1 minus z to the power minus 1 and this is v n z. Okay. So, c 1 um, this part uh, c 1 divided this is integrated to time constant. Okay. Now, what do we see? So, let us compare the two expressions v out 1 and uh, okay. what do you see here? This is half delay and this is no delay. Pawan, is that right? Okay. And what about this one? This is unit delay and this is half delay again. So, I think now you can see where I am going with it, right. You can change when you look at the output and you can manipulate these delays what you want in the expression, okay. All right. Now, I think Leo, you asked me the question, or there was one more person here, he was sitting in the back, and I do not see him here. But uh, basically, you can explain this integrator time uh, integrator using our e to the power j omega t. I think you did, right. So, we are going to go into that because that will be a lot more detail. Uh, so, that is the next level. Uh, of understanding that we are going to go through. Okay. So, when we did h of s minus 1 over s c r, then that was our minus omega naught over s. Okay. So, what we said is that hey, um, you know this actually let us not get into that, let us just get into this straight away. You can say e to the power z is equal to and this is our transformation right e to the power uh, j omega t. So, um, what is z is discrete time and s is continuous time. So, we are going to migrate back to continuous time and we are going to see how it is going to look like all these delays you know what do they really do to you. Okay. So, let us take a 0 delay integrator. How do you specify 0 delay integrator? It will be uh, it is c 1 divided by c 2 and divided by 1 minus z to the power minus 1, right. And if you substitute z equal to e to the power j minus j omega t, what do you get? c 1 divided by c 2 divided by 1 minus e to the power minus j omega t, correct. Okay. Now, I am going to multiply by e to the power um, j omega t by 2 both sides top and bottom. Okay. What will happen? You will get c 1 divided by c 2 and this will look like e to the power j omega t divided by 2 minus e to the power minus j omega t divided by 2. Is that part clear? I am just rolling this in. I multiplied and divided by the same and then I am just ruling this in, this in and then we are going to get um, on the top you are going to get e to the power j omega t divided by 2. Okay. So, this is further going to look like let us just solve it one more time. Uh, then we have to have uh, what is this transfer? What do you, can you do? Do you know? Huh? What? Is something else missing? to j. Okay, good. j was missing okay. and this is c 1 divided by c 2. Okay. We will keep this e to the power j omega t divided by 2 okay. and now we will also multiply by uh, one more thing which is omega t and omega t top and bottom just sake of convenience. Now, what does the expression look like? This 1 over j omega Okay, so, this is j and this is omega, I am going to take it out okay. and that what does that represent? 1 over s integration okay. and then we also got uh, c 1 divided by uh, c 2 times t. Do you see that? Okay. So, this t I am going to, I took the omega, I took the t, I brought it back inside here okay, all right. and now I am going to get omega t divided by 2 divided by sin of omega t divided by 2. 
okay and else what is left e to the power j omega t divided by 2 all right so 1 over j omega is the integrator okay c1 divided by c2 t is a integrator constant okay which is um, this would be for example omega not equal to fs c1 divided by c2 like that right okay and what is this this is a magnitude error yeah it's magnitude error because uh, ideally i just want this part in the integrator i don't want anything else okay unfortunately i have to deal with this error okay and this this part is what is this part that's a phase error are you with me so far so what we did is we just took a discrete time integrator in this particular class zero delay integrator and then we substituted z equal to e to the power j omega t and then we did some manipulation which we all of you are familiar with and we ended up with the ideal continuous time representation which is 1 over s okay multiplied by the integrator time constant which is uh, you know omega not and then we have some magnitude error and we have phase error okay now we're going to do the same thing for all three integrators we have three integrators one is zero delay half delay and unit delay all three of them and we're going to then figure out you know how do they match up with each other all right so if we did the same thing um one delay integrator and that would be c1 divided by c2 z to the power minus 1 divided by 1 minus z to the power minus 1 okay that's the uh, unit delay integrator and here what you will find is i mean it's really simple to figure this out but uh, i'll just give you the final expression t hmm? and then we have okay and here you would get e to the power minus j omega t divided by 2 okay so this is again the phase error and this is your mag error okay now you can already guess what's the half delay going to look like what do you think any guesses which is c1 divided by c2 and then this is z to the power minus half 1 minus z to the power minus half okay and you already gave me the answer and what this is going to look like is 1 over j omega c1 divided by c2 t got it and then omega t divided by 2 sin of omega t divided by 2 okay and there is no phase error as you said it okay so if you look at half delay integrator okay it's called lossless discrete integrator and i'll explain why that is and here in this case um, so if you if you look at the half delay integrator right we have not made any approximations okay and if you remember um, what was a q quality factor we expected imaginary one over imaginary number and if you had imaginary plus real part then then you get you know bad quality factor right but if in this case it's perfectly imaginary without any approximations okay just because of the zero half delay integrator so the quality factor in this case is infinity is this part clear i'm connecting the two dots which we mentioned like a lecture ago about the quality factor of the integrator okay if the integrator has just 1 over j omega then it's a perfect integrator but if integrator has 1 over j omega plus some real thing then it's not a perfect integrator then you have to take ratio of the um, you know real part with imaginary part and that decides the quality factor of the integrator 
okay so if the real part becomes zero then the integrator quality factor will be infinite okay all right so in the case of zero uh, zero delay which is um, 1 over 1 minus z to the power minus 1 which is equal to 1 minus e to the power minus j omega t correct that's what we got and this we can write it uh, using Euler's identity okay and what is the Euler's identity 1 minus cos of omega t plus j sin of omega t okay and suddenly you see hey the quality factor is not good with this one because I have some real part and I have imaginary part correct okay so the q in this case is given by um, sine of omega t divided by 1 minus cos of omega t and similarly you can do uh, so this has a positive q and uh, the other one the one delay uh, one delay okay you can say it's a negative q same uh, same way of doing this okay so we kind of understand what three integrator configurations are doing to you in terms of magnitude and phase phase is under control we know now let's look at the magnitude part okay mag error so magnitude error is omega t divided by 2 divided by sine of omega t divided by 2 okay so let's substitute uh, omega is equal to 2 pi f right so this is 2 pi f divided by um, 2 fs t is uh, 1 over fs and divided by um, sine of pi f over fs right so that's what you get okay and fs is equal to 1 over t what is t by the way period of the clock okay remember that we have this non overlapping clocks right which is going tick tock tick tock and that is the period of that is uh, the time period which is the sampling clock which, which is what we are saying okay. So now um, we can simplify uh, and let us say so the filter uh, that we are trying to do right of course uh, we are sampling so once you sample what happens the range of uh, interest is reduced to fs by 2 you cannot have co anything come in beyond fs by 2 nyquist uh, criteria right if you if something comes in at higher frequencies then what happens it folds back it will fold back fold right back in and you won't be able to distinguish okay so first of all you cannot have anything in the signal spectrum which is above fs over 2 now if so we are going to talk about f over fs okay and we are going to talk about this mag error which is pi f divided by fs divided by sine of pi f by fs all right so let us say f over fs is phi which means that the sampling frequency is five times higher than the content basically you you were designing a filter um, you know for the frequency range from let us say uh, you know 0 to um, 10 megahertz okay and the sampling frequency is 50 megahertz okay what 0 to 10 megahertz what does that mean that does not mean the corner of the filter is 10 megahertz the interest basically including the stop band has to be up to 10 megahertz okay because after that um, so, so this, the filter corner may be as, as much as 1 megahertz let us say but you are also interested in 1 megahertz to 10 megahertz because that is your stop band right okay. So the frequency of interest for your filter is let us say 10 megahertz and your sampling rate is 50 megahertz which is f, f over fs of phi. Then the maximum magnitude error you are going to get is 1.0689 almost 7 percent error okay that is the error you are going to get in your magnitude response you were supposed to get something like this right and then instead you are going to get something that uh, you know that will have some magnitude error and it will not I do not know exactly how to look like but you will not get an accurate response okay because of that if this is let us say factor of 10 then this will look like 1.01 1 
66, which is almost like 2%. Okay. I'm making a point here. Um, so if it is 15, it will be 1.0073. And then if it's 20, then you get 1.004124. Okay. And just to take it forward, it's going to be 1.0026, something like that. So the point is, hmm? oh, thank you. So um, um, FS is a factor of 5, larger, right? Okay. Good point. So, uh, so the point I'm trying to make now is that if your FS is 20x, the frequency of interest, then here onwards, it doesn't, I mean, you know, the capacitor matching itself is like 0.1%. So there is no point in, you know, pushing the sampling rate higher and higher because uh, if, I remember, when you do circuit design, right, you have to address the weakest link, okay, and you address the weakest link until it doesn't makes, uh, make any difference. Right? So, for example, there is no point in having F over FS of 100, 1 over 100, because it doesn't make a difference, right? because uh, uh, our capacitor matching is not going to be any better than that. So, that, this is kind of the judgment that you will get of after you work on a few things. So, in this case, you can say that, hey, um, you know, FS should be 20x the frequency of interest. That's kind of the rule of thumb when you do switch cap circuits. To, to maintain the, the sanctity of the response and make it look like just like a regular filter, um, you won't have any worry about any magnitude errors for that matter. Okay? Having said that, people also do um, ha have done um, you know, um, filters with uh, F over FS, um, you know, lot smaller than this. Um, and there what you do is you can do something like pre-distortion, right? You know that this is what you're going to get, so you, then you twist everything around, your coefficients and all that good stuff to make sure that you get reasonably good approximation. Okay? But for us, for the sake of our discussion today, um, the, 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 what I'm trying to tell you is, uh, you know, this is, this is what is important, you know, ratio, to reduce the magnitude error. Okay? So now I'm going to take you to the next step, where, which, is, which becomes very interesting now. Okay? How do you design a filter now? So you learned about all these different integrators, um, and um, you learned about um, um, you know LDI integrators. You learned about different delays, positive input, negative input, and how do you do parasitic insensitive okay filter? So I'm going to take you to the next step, which is you know design example. From that, what did we figure out? It needs to be a third order filter, okay? And then we uh, created a RLC filter based on that. Okay, so uh, these are the values from the table. Of course, this is for which frequency? One radian per second. Okay, all right. Then uh, that's the one radian per second. So when we translate it to 62.8 uh, me uh, mega radians per second, then we divide it down right here, and then we get 16.4 nanofarads and 18.3 nano henrys oh, those are the values so this is the filter that that we have to implement earlier we implemented using active rc basically continuous time integrators right now we are going to do it using the switch caps okay and we are going to put all the stuff that we did together um, uh, in today's lecture in this part uh, i may not get all the time but then we will review it again next time okay so the the, the step from here to here this is clear to you, right? This is nothing else but signal flow graph, and then um, and these are a bunch of integrators, and they have different constants. This is K1, this is K2, and this is K3. Okay, and signs uh, we went through that pretty uh, thoroughly. So K1 is given by one divided by C1, K2 is given by one divided by L2. Okay, and this is one over C3. Okay. And why is that? Because we are representing 1 over SC, 1 over SL, and 1 over SC again. Right? And that's where, uh, and when you say K1, it's K1 over S. So that's why K is equal to 1 over C1 and all these numbers. right? And these are the basically K1, K2, K3, they are the integrator UG, unity gain frequencies. All right? Okay. So now, we want to replace these with switch cap integrators. How do you do that? Okay. Uh, first of all, um, you want at least some factor 
from the ripple bandwidth. Okay. In this case, the ripple bandwidth is 10 megahertz. So we say that my sampling rate has to be at least 200 megahertz, factor of 20. Okay. We don't, let's say we don't care as much about the stop band part. But if you really care about that stop band, which is 60 megahertz, then it has to be 60 megahertz times 20 megahertz. So you have to run the filter at such high frequency. Okay. So this part is done. So in this case, I'm saying that, okay, I worry about only the ripple, ripple bandwidth, but you can choose differently. So this is 200 megahertz. So now this is omega naught. Okay, Fs C1 over C2. This we derived from the previous expression, right? So we can put it here, uh, omega naught is equal to um, Fs C1 over C2, and that is equal to, for example, for this particular one, 1 over C1, which is 1 over 16.4 nano. Okay, so what this is going to give us is C1 divided by C2, or in this case, I have flipped it, C2 divided by C1, is going to come out to be 3.28. That's it. That's all you need. You just need a ratio of the two capacitors. And how do we get those ratios? By doing unit cell designs and very accurately. And that we can match to 0.1%. So um, similarly, the other case, it's going to be 3.66. Okay. 1 over 18.3 uh, nano, and then we will get this number. So once we have these two numbers, we know the integrators need to have these ratios. Specifically, um, uh, the, the, the capacitor C2, which is the, the feedback capacitor, has to be 3.28 times larger than the unit capacitor. Okay? And in this case, the second one, it should be 3.66. Okay? Thank you, everyone.